Bob Delaney's riveting life story has been told by HBO's Real Sports, ESPN, and ABC, and dozens of newspapers and magazine articles throughout the United States and Europe. Delaney has, written, has risen to the top of two elite organizations. In law enforcement as a highly decorated trooper with the New Jersey State Police, and as one of the National Basketball Association's most respected referees. Delaney has made a major contribution away from the game as well. He testified before the United States Senate on organized crime in 1981, detailing his perilous undercover work for the, New, uh, for the Jersey State Police, putting his life online for nearly three years, infiltrating the Genovese and Bruno crime families. Delaney presents leadership and teamwork seminars before corporate, university, and community organizations. For the past 30 years, he has provided training before federal, state, county, and local law enforcement officials and agents through the United States, Canada, and Europe. He has helped to understand and identify symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and the impact it has on the individual and the ripple effect to family and friends. He spoke at Fort Hood to soldiers and law enforcement after the horrific shootings on November 5, 2009. Delaney is currently working on a new book titled Surviving the Shadows, A Journey of Hope into Post-Traumatic Stress. General Norman Schwarzkopf, U.S. Army retired, said of Delaney, as an undercover operative in Project Alpha, Bob Delaney infiltrated organized crime rings in New Jersey ultimately leading to the conviction of more than 30 mafia criminals. Delaney's heroic performance during his perilous assignment represents the finest traditions of the New Jersey State Police. My father, the first superintendent of the New Jersey State Police Department, would have been proud of him. During 2009 and 10, Delaney visited the armed forces in Iraq and visited wounded warriors at Lansdowell Hospital in Germany. General Bob Brown, U.S. Army Commander of the 25th Infantry Division, said of Delaney's trip to Iraq, he related to soldiers better than any visitor I have seen in my 28 years in the military. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like for you to meet and greet Bob Delaney, and we'll have a brief video to lead into that. 1975, I was a New Jersey State Trooper who went undercover and infiltrated the mob. I became Bobby Cover. Stolen loads, buying guns, loan sharking. When I was undercover, I had a costume. That costume was Bobby Cover. My morality changed. To me, bad guys were putting bullets in people's heads. Bad guy wasn't somebody who was stealing. That was just a guy that was putting bread on his table. I learned the street. I learned about what it was like to be a wise guy. There was a threat on my life. When you hear it and you think that somebody in this world is targeting you, it eats at you. And it stays with me to this day. When I surfaced from working undercover, I was working a summer pro league and someone saw me working the ball game, asked if I was interested in the NBA. I wanted to see some things that were good in society. The bad guys would win if I stopped living my life. Here's my story. Thanks uh, for that beautiful introduction, Steve. You read it exactly as my mother wrote it. Um, it's great to be here and uh, see so many familiar faces. Um, this story, Covert, is how I get before you. And I'll share a little bit about it and then bring in some thoughts about leadership. In 1973, I followed in my father's footsteps and joined the New Jersey State Police. And as Steve stated in the introduction, that organization was founded by Colonel Norman Schwarzkopf. It's steeped in deep military tradition. Just by the uniforms we wear, if any of you have been through the great state of New Jersey and have had the pleasure of interacting with one of the troopers as you go up and down the Garden State Parkway, you see that beautiful uniform that they wear and it has leather going in all different directions. We kind of look like German stormtroopers. And if you hear the name Schwarzkopf, you know why. But General Schwarzkopf was around us a great deal, representing his father as I was growing up in that organization. And it, keep in mind that deep military tradition. Because I was a general road duty trooper. 
1973 to 1975. And it was a great way to work because we lived like firemen at a house. Our station was where we lived for two days on, two days off, and then we'd go home. But I got a call one day when I was stationed in Somerville, New Jersey, and there was a little note on the box in, in the office that said, I needed to call division headquarters and speak with Lieutenant John Liddy. Folks, I grew up Irish Catholic. That means you wake up guilty in the morning. <laughs> I thought I did something wrong. I'm wondering why this lieutenant from division headquarters wants to talk to me. And I'm asking the other troopers, and they said, well, maybe you gave a ticket to a mob guy, the guy who's in organized crime. Jack came up and had a conversation with me, asked if I was interested in doing undercover work. I said, yes, sir. He walked away. I said, Lieutenant, is it narcotics? What is it? Because back then, that's all we were doing. It was narcs back in, in those days. And he said, I'll get back to you, and if you tell anybody that I'm speaking to, you're going to be out of the running. Fast forward. That investigation became known as the New Jersey Joint Intelligence Operation, codenamed Project Alpha. There were two New Jersey state troopers and three FBI agents that made up our own trucking company on the waterfront in New Jersey. It was the FBI, New Jersey State Police, and the President's Organized Crime Task Force that was going to look at how organized crime infiltrates legitimate business. The story is in the book cover. That, to me, is part of where I wanted to get with the story. Because I thought the greatest day of my life was after three years of working in an undercover capacity, becoming another person, and the name Bobby Covert is a catchy name for an undercover guy. But we weren't trying to be funny or cute. Back in those days, the word covert was not as well known and used in the military and law enforcement terms. I actually took on the identity of a child who died at birth. The death records and birth records are not cross-indexed in our country. So if you go to the death records, find someone who died at birth, you can start that persona. So we have the first name the same, ethnic background, Delaney, covert, Irish, German. It covered me in my new identity as Bobby Covert. And I thought that day was going to be the greatest day of my life when I came back to the fold that I was part of the New Jersey State Police again. And yet I found it to be one of the most difficult days of my life. For those of you in law enforcement in this room, you know what takes place. Four o'clock in the morning, you meet at some location. For us, it was the West Orange Armory. Two troopers in uniform, an FBI agent, state police detective go out and they pick up the defendants. It was 30 mob guys picked up around the state of New Jersey, New York. Others arrested in Florida and Philadelphia. And as they brought them in, they go through the processing. And they're fingerprinting them and taking pictures. And I was upstairs in civilian clothes. A sergeant by the name of Barry Lardier was assigned to be with me. He was in plain clothes as well, but he had his ID on his pocket. I didn't. He said, you want to walk downstairs and see what's going on? As we did, probably in a bravado type kind of way, because I knew this was the first time I would be confronting the individuals that I had been living with for three years, I put my hands behind my back in a military parade rest position, put my chest out, because I'm going to go eye to eye with the guys that I had locked up. A guy by the name of Ronnie Sardella was being fingerprinted. Ronnie I had stolen trucks with, I had done a lot of criminal activity with. Ronnie looked over at me and he said, Bobby, what they pinch you for? And before I could answer, Barry said, pinch, he's with us, he's a trooper. He obviously thought I was handcuffed, I dropped my hands. And he looked at me and the look that went between us was not one of anger, it was of disappointment. He said, Bobby, how could you do this to me? How could you do it to us? You're our friend. I can tell you what everybody had on their feet the rest of the day because I couldn't pick my head up. It felt terrible. And I had a guilt that took place. A few days later, after the raid took place, I got called to division headquarters again. And I was told that there was a informant information and they played a wiretap where there was talk of a hit on me. That doesn't make for a great day. Paranoia started to take place. The story that I wanted to share in telling the story of covert 
was not as much the soprano West type investigation that I was a part of, but what took place afterwards. For 30 years, I've been on a journey of healing in dealing with post-traumatic stress. I got lucky in the game of life. A detective by the name of John Schroth, a good friend of mine, came to me one day after I had been surfaced for about three to four months, and I was testifying in court, and every once in a while we'd stop off at, you know, after a surveillance or after I would testify, we'd stop off in a bar, and I'd go back into my Bobby Covert persona. I'd be buying everybody in the place drinks. I'd be getting a kiss on the cheek and doing the whole mob routine. And he said, I don't know what's going on with you, but something's wrong. And then I got lucky again. My psychology professor in college, as Steve said, I went to New Jersey City University. That's also known as Harvard on the Hudson in Jersey. And Hank Campbell was my psychology professor. And he was doing work with Jersey City Police Department, and we started doing some informal therapy. I started sharing with him what I was feeling. And he said to me, Bobby, you're going through post-traumatic stress. And I said, no, that's stuff that I hear guys coming back from Vietnam go through, not me. Went into total denial. Another telltale symptom. And one more time, I got lucky. Louis Free, who became the 15th director of the FBI, was a case agent with us. He was a surface agent while I was undercover. He was also doing the same thing for another case in New York. An FBI agent by the name of Joe Pistone was working that case. You know him as Donnie Brasco. And Joe and I are good friends to this day because I can speak with Joe and I know he gets and understands what I am going through. And the same thing I can do for him. The story of Covert has been a good investment for this country. Because not only did we lock up a bunch of mob guys back in the day, but to this day, it's a story that continues to help law enforcement, military firefighters. The work that I'm doing today is with people that are experiencing traumatic events. And because of the experiences I had in this story, that I'm able to share with them and help them be reflective on what may be going on in their lives. And that's part of leadership. The leadership process is something that we are all a part of. As Steve said in the introduction, I do presentations on that. And there's 10 different tools that I speak of for leaders. We're only going to talk about two or three here today. First, when uh, Diana, Dill, and, and Steve came to me and asked about presenting here, and Julia Renabar made the connection, that they were told me it was 15 minutes that I would have to speak. I do 15 minutes at home when the refrigerator light goes on. <laughs> if you haven't figured it out yet, I like to talk. And for those of you who are not from the Northeast, and those that are, if I start talking real fast, maybe you can help those people understand what's going on. Because really, it's not that far different. I may say you guys, you say y'all. I mean, we're all in the same boat. <laughs> One of the things that's so important about understanding leadership is everyone's role. So there are leaders, there are followers, there are collaborators, and that role changes within the leadership process. Leadership is a process. It's not owned by anyone. It's not one individual who creates leadership. What's taking place here in this room is leadership. It's take, take stock in children. There are the folks that are stepping up as the sponsors and providing dollars. There are people that are here that are with their students that are spending time. Everyone plays a role in the leadership process and the leader changes at times. And our ability to communicate is important. You know, the good sisters of St. Dominic that taught me, told me, Delaney, you got two ears and one mouth. That means God wants you to do twice as much listening as you do speaking. We are not really good at listening. How many times you're at a cocktail party and really what's taking place is that when I'm having a conversation with this gentleman and he triggers something in my mind that I want to say, I stopped listening. All I'm waiting for him is to take a breath so I can jump in because my thought is the most important at the time. 